Sometimes injustice can disguise itself as justice. There's this, there's this weird thing um, about uh, the way that we associate the night. We typically associate the night with what? Bad activity, right? Um, we think of uh, the scandalous behavior that goes on in the middle of the night, or mischievous wrongdoing, or evil intent. So late night partying, cat burglars, and the occasional procrastination due to a, a deadline that is coming up and all the cramming that you're doing. This is all equal sin in the eyes of God, isn't it? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the night kind of gives us a great visual, though, of what's happening. Um, at night, the idea that we're hiding our deeds under the cover of darkness to keep them from being exposed by the light, right? Because these are things that we would not do if everyone else could see what we were doing, what we're watching, and what's watching and, and happening to us. So how fitting is it then that in the middle of the night, Jesus was arrested? In that same night, he was tried and convicted before even the morning happens. And in the morning, he's executed. And this all takes place secretly, right? It's purposeful in this way that it actually happens at night. So during Jesus' arrest, he pointed out uh, the Jewish leader's attempt to hide their actions. Uh, so he says this to them. He said, when I was with you day after day in the temple... You did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. The power of darkness. This is its real power, and it comes in this real moment, and Jesus is recognizing this. So the Gospel of Luke, prior to this, actually establishes a routine that Jesus held. So, so it says that every day he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olive, and early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple near him. So Jesus, Jesus was not hiding, right? So it wasn't like the only way that they were going to find him was if they were scouring, and it just happened to be night that they finally stumbled upon him, okay? He was, uh, he was plainly available to them. Although there was this time period with the Pharisees, that he always kept ducking out and disappearing because it wasn't time for the crucifixion. The Pharisees were very much like, we'd like to kill you, and he's just, just not now, so he goes and hides. But here in this, this particular week, he is publicly available, right? He's right there with them in the temple courts, always. Yet they chose, for some reason, to conceal their actions against Jesus by the darkness of night. So first, it's important to establish uh, what are the motivations of one who is in the darkness. It's not just a love of being in the darkness, like I just prefer the night versus the day. It's actually also a direct hatred for the light. For what's light's mission, right? It's to bring what is in the darkness into the light, right? But you, if you look at it from darkness's perspective, its point of view that sounds like you're eradicating me. That sounds like my existence is in danger, right? Because wherever there's light, there cannot be darkness, right? So what are we talking about outside of the analogy of light and darkness, right? Although I think there are real implications to the real reality that we have, um, that there is more going on than just an analogy when we talk about light and dark. The, the light is the truth, it is righteousness. It is the way of God. And that means that darkness then is what? The opposite, right? It's the, it's the absence of such things. It is dead and ignorant of the goodness of such things. When light is presented to darkness, it reminds me of like when you turn the lights on super fast, right? You're sitting in darkness and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, like your eyes can't even, can't even function or see, right? Um, this is what happens when you come out of a movie theater or, you know, like you introduced to the day again, right? You're, you're just blinded. You can't see. Everything is like being exposed, right? But it's also that everything when it comes into the light is being judged. It's being weighted in comparison. My eyes had adjusted. This was the lifestyle I was used to, right? And then what? Light comes and I'm not a used to this lifestyle. I'm not used to this thing and I'm weighted based on what is now presented to me. Um, we know John 3.16, I'm assuming 
Maybe we need to cover it another sermon for another time, perhaps. But what is it? That for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We tend to take John 3.16, we can tend to kind of yank it out by itself and we say, this is the gospel. And I would like to kind of put this thing of, we need to really share the gospel of John 3.16 continued. Okay, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Right? Because there's, there's more happening in here. The very next verse says, but, but here's this, Jesus did not come to condemn, he came to save, right? So there's no condemnation when Jesus is coming, right? And yet, by Jesus coming, it actually implies there's a judgment. Okay, it's like, well, no condemnation, right? Yeah, but, but I'm being judged. What's going on? How is, this, how is this possible? It says in verse 19, and this is the judgment, though. There's a judgment that's coming, no condemnation, but here's the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Not because they liked their evil works more than the light, because their works were evil. This light is his Jesus. He is the visible sum of all truth, and there is no darkness in him. And you note that the verse says that Jesus basically has come to us who are in darkness. If we were not in darkness, then he wouldn't have come, right? So there is a judgment that is happening. Verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light. It does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. We avoid exposure because of fear of judgment, the truth revealed. So even the, the, the smallest, the little brightness that we might get exposed to, it actually terrifies us and we run back into the shadows. It's like when you turn a light switch on and suddenly you see all the mice on the ground and they all scatter and go into the darkness as quickly as they can. Oh, we didn't want you to know that we were here. We surprised us. There's something of great importance that we can't actually understand when we're in the darkness. But as soon as we're in the light, suddenly it's, it's very much revealed. Running from this judgment is actually what brings about our condemnation. When we stay in the light, though, there's a promise that we have. It comes in, in Ephesians. It says, but when anything is exposed to the light, it becomes visible, right? For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, wake up, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Jesus brings things hidden into truth. This is also what his word and the law does. It reveals to us the true state of our situation in the darkness. But now, here's the important thing that we don't sometimes get when we're in the darkness. Christ comes and he shines a light not just merely to reveal. He also comes to transform. And we, we just don't want to trust that quite yet. So we don't understand this until we're in the full truth of what it means to be brought into his righteous judgment. I hate to be judged. No, we, we should want to be judged by Jesus. But we avoid this judgment because we know that we deserve condemnation, right? And this is why Jesus comes to us and dies for us. Why what? While we are still sinners, Right? Light is the one that comes to the darkness. And then there's something that's amazing and that's extended to us as soon as that happens. The sentence of our judgment is then carried out by him. And if we stop running from the truth, we then are made anew in the light. So anyone in the darkness can't see the goodness of this judgment of exposure. It hates the light for the sake of self-preservation, right? This is the way my life is. I like the way things are. I would keep it because I'm in control and I know what's going on. This, this, this thing, this light that's coming, it sounds like it's something that's threatening my very existence. I want nothing to do with it. And this is the Jewish leaders, right? The Jewish leaders are witnessing and experiencing Jesus, the divine authority of Jesus, and they're like, this is a threat to a way of our life. This is not good. We don't like this light, it's over there, and all we see is it coming closer, and we're going to get wiped out, we're in control, let's take care of this thing. So they're very aware of the malice behind their deeds. 
And they justify this under the pretext of, well, we're just vindicated, right? We, we've vind there's vindication here. We, yet something causes them to conceal it. They don't say, we're the righteous ones, we're going to do this. For some reason, they know what they're doing is wrong, and they do it under the cloak of night. And the night in question, their actions were methodical. They were planned out. They were conniving. They were plotted. They were diabolical. And they were also unjustly. And they did this in the dead of the night because they were literally afraid of being exposed. But it wasn't from God. They weren't afraid of being exposed from God because for somehow their twisted view, they saw that God was somehow on their side of the situation. It was the people. See? Now the feast of the unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. So first, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, they were like a back-to-back -back celebration that took place. In the New Testament times, they were basically inseparable. They were practically the same thing. That's why they're almost referred to that like that. But it's an eight-day festival that takes place. Starts with the preparation of Passover, and then you have the Sabbath right in the middle of it, and it continues on and becomes even a bigger celebration. Uh, the Passover, the particular that part, reflected over the deliverance of God's people out of slavery in Egypt. It also was a celebration that they uh, were spared from the angel of death. And so you would see hundreds of thousands of Jews flock to Jerusalem at this time. Very crowded, super crowded, in order to participate in the consumption of the Passover lamb. So it's almost like everyone has gathered. So how fitting is it that Jesus, the true Passover lamb, is sacrificed when everyone has come together at this time? The Jewish leaders are terrified of the backlash of plotting to kill Jesus. They want to do it, but they're, they're afraid that there's going to be backlash because the people loved Jesus. Remember, they just, they just paraded him into town. He's the king, right? They're afraid of this. Mark 11 highlights that their fear of Jesus living was because the people were always astonished by his teaching. Just they're so impressed by that. I would take a little offense if you think about it for a second, his teaching's better than our teaching. How dare he, right? We're supposed to be the high and mighty teachers, right? They feared an uproar, though, from the people. That it, so it had to be done. It had to be done quickly without the awareness of the public so that they could control the narrative, right? So having Jesus assassinated would actually create an uprising. Big mistake. Don't assassinate Jesus. Bad idea, right? And their positions of power were only safe by Rome, as long as there was never a rebellion, right? They, were, they, they liked where they were, the comfortability of what was going on, um, and so they needed, him, they needed Jesus to be found guilty, and they needed him to be found um, convicted, not just by them, but by Rome, and then executed by Rome. Oh, there's nothing we can do about it, Rome. Oh, sorry, you know. So uh, they wanted to do this right, right? But they also wanted to control the outcome too, right? <laughs> Let's do this right, folks, but as long as it turns out the way that I want it to turn out, okay? So was it going to work to hold an actual Jewish trial um, held by the high council? First off, that takes two days because you got to gather all the witnesses, which means two days of that being spread around town. Uh, could you imagine? Uh, this is not going to work out. So we got to do this quick in the night, when no one is looking, and there's urgency to have him killed before the festival begins, before the unleavened bread festival begins, before things get really crazy, we need to make sure we take care of him. So the midnight trials take place. It's not one trial, by the way. There's, there's multiple trials that happen that night. It's not just one. And in each way, they both failed and succeeded. First, they failed because each one demonstrated the opposite of what the Jewish leaders wanted to have happen. Every time they had a trial with Jesus, it always kind of further demonstrated the innocence of Jesus and the wickedness of the Jewish leaders, right? But they also succeeded because they just did it anyways. They just convicted him anyhow. Even though that he kept being proven innocent, ah, we just, we'll get him, okay? And that's because that's what they always wanted. So they bent and broke their own rules uh, just to get that. 
The injustice of what took place was not just in the outcome of the verdict, but it was also in the way that the trials were conducted. Often we hope for a trial to do what? To reveal the truth, to bring forth the truth so that everyone can know. And that's what everyone's searching for when there's a trial, right? You've, you've seen enough TV shows to know that that is not true, right? They didn't care to discover the truth of Jesus. In fact, I, I bet you anything they knew more about the truth of Jesus than they're willing to admit. And they wanted their predetermined outcome anyways, because they felt justified obtaining it, right? So I want you to remember this. Sometimes injustice can disguise itself as justice. This is the reality of the trial of Jesus. Now, many times we feel like this perfectly describes our life. When you're looking at that sentence, you're like, yes, that's me. That's what happened to me, right? But how often are we willing to see ourselves no different than the Jewish leaders, that we're the one conducting this? Sometimes injustice can disguise itself as justice. And while this is the reality of the trial of Jesus, it is the reality of the cross is the complete opposite, right? There's justification being provided through an injustice. So this series, we're going to look at, at the four individual hearings that basically take up and make up the trial of Jesus, okay? We're going to have our own courtroom drama, if you will. So Brennan um, is going to be passing around some roles for all of us to play, and it's going to help us understand the severity of what took place. Each, each week, we're not doing it just this week, each week you're going to be given a card, and this is uh, your role, if you will, of you, either a witness or a participant of these events. And it's an opportunity for us to put ourselves in their shoes, right? Or their, their sandals, if you will, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's, let's set the scene, okay? <clears throat> he went out with his disciples across the brook of Kidron, and there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So here we see a multitude of soldiers. There's a, 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 a detachment or a band, and that would consist of a, a roughly the upwards of 700 soldiers. We don't really know if all 700 soldiers were there, but you would imagine a good chunk of them. There was also the temple guards were present, right? And then there would be servants that, that officially served the chief priests. And they were there because they're representing the um, chief priests. The, the irony of this, though, is, is that uh, we don't really know if the chief priests were there or not. But the way Jesus talks almost makes it sound like, yeah, there's somewhere in the crowd just keeping an eye on things, making sure everything goes down well. But if I've mentioned you at this point, would you stand real quick? But look around the room. This seems like overkill, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't it? You guys can sit down. Yet the chief priests and Pharisees have attempted to detain Jesus before, right? They tried to stone him. They've also tried to throw him off a cliff. That did not work, right? Yet Jesus in some way, just in his supernatural way, somehow escapes every time. And this is important to understand. The Jewish leaders are aware of this. They're not denying that somehow Jesus has a supernatural power to escape. And they don't even deny Jesus' miracles. In fact, when he resurrects Lazarus, they're like, well, we can't have Lazarus live, right? So we got to kill him now. They are not denying this. They're reacting to everything that Jesus does. So they send a fleet to make absolutely sure that this time he's captured. We're make, we know he's escaped before. It's just because we didn't bring enough. So here we are. We're bringing more and more. But then verse 3 hits and you see Judas. Now, I'm not going to have Judas stand because I think there's just too much shame attached to that card already, okay? May as well have, leave Judas somewhere in the crowd alone. Oh, I think someone raised their hand. They already outed themselves. 
that's actually fitting for Judas. Judas was also pretty arrogant and foolish too. So, uh, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to look at this real quick. This is Judas having procured. It's lambano. And it means to actually receive. Your translation might say that he brought. Like he was just, you know, the rat pointing out where to go, right? But it means to take hold and to make one's own. Do not mistake this. Judas has been handed this party to lead. He is leading them. And Luke confirms this. So Judas is, is again, often depicted as an informant. And I was watching the Passion of Christ um, and watching, watching the scene unfold, and they've got, one, not enough people there. Um, but the second thing, which, I mean, the, the money alone to require that many people in your movie, that would have been outrageous. Or CGI them all. It's expensive. But anyways, um, they, they bring... They bring uh, Judas, but Judas is almost like, no, no, I don't want to go, right? And then it gets an eye of Jesus like, oh, turn back, turn back. No, 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 you don't understand, right? He wasn't like the guards were like, come on, do this thing for us. He was leading. Judas has been given power over the operation. And that's important to note. He is directing. He is leading them, right? And how do you think this makes him feel, right? How do you suppose it makes him feel? Probably important right? Yeah. Maybe even finally a little bit appreciated. Look, I know I've had these leadership qualities. Finally, I'm getting some recognition, right? It feels prestigious. That's a lot to be given, right? Not a small operation. In fact, it's almost an advancement in his career, right? His leadership is like moving up the ladder. You have to remember like the, the Pharisees, Sadducees, these are all sects of the Jewish people, right? This is all different leadership. Jesus is sometimes just another leadership of the Jewish people. And Jesus has been talking this whole time like, I'm going to die. I, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. Judas might be looking, it's time to jump ship, maybe move up the ladder in another one. So I'm making a lateral move, right? How did we get here though? How did we get here with Judas in this? So let's go back six days prior. Okay? And this might help us understand his reasoning better. So six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And keep in mind, Judas is witness to the divine power from Jesus. Okay? So they gave a dinner from him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. And Mary Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment and made made it from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with a fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, I love this, Gospel of John, the other Gospels do this too, but they emphasize Judas Iscariot to be remembered as the betrayer. There's no like plot twist, you know, happening in there. It's just straight from the beginning. First time Judas is mentioned, oh, he's the betrayer. Let's just establish that, right? Here's what he says. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? I'm going to give it to him that this is actually a legitimate question, right? It's a legitimate question and very practical in the sense. It seems like a waste. But here comes verse 6. He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Having charge of the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put into it. So here's the true motivation taking place here now, right? He's not concerned about the poor. There's injustice disguised as justice. Judas is a thief. It's about controlling and determining the use of things for God on his own terms. I'll follow God, but I want, you know, I feel like I need more in order to follow God. Whatever kind of justification that he needed to tell himself, right? And Jesus said to him, leave her alone, for that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have This then sparks Judas 
to seek out the chief priests. He didn't recruit them. or They didn't recruit him. Excuse me. He went looking for the chief priests. They weren't just like, who could we manipulate and control out of the 12, right? He is retaliating to Jesus' rebuke. I don't like what you just told me. I don't like the way you talk to me. So instead, instead of taking correction, I'm going to rebuke you. And I'm going to do it in a much more vengeful way. And then these words, they are so incredibly haunting every time I think about them. Um, This is what he says to the Pharisees and the chief priests. What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. They rewarded him. Looks like he got his cut after all, right? I love that This is very interesting and helps us understand why Jesus talked about it so much. But the love of money played a hand in the death of Jesus. Jesus says that we cannot serve two masters. Isn't that interesting? And then Judas, what does he do? He begins to plot. And he plots as the Jewish leaders plot, right? The Gospel of Luke has Judas looking for a moment when Jesus is absent of the crowds. He knows Jesus' routine. He knows what he does. He knows how he's going. So now he's starting to think, yeah, how can we make sure that this happens when no one is looking? And this is where things get vile. This is where things get wicked and evil behavior takes place. The stuff that you and I would be in years of therapy if our friends did this to us, okay? And it's not Jesus getting arrested. That's not the worst part. The worst part is that Judas goes back and he has the Passover with Jesus and he sits there right beside him as if nothing is wrong. He lives the lie. Now I'm just going to read to you about his response here. I'm not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel. He who ate my bread, I want you to remember that, has lifted his heel against me. And I am telling you this now, therefore therefore before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. And truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked around at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. And one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus, at Jesus' side. And so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking, right? This is John, by the way. John loves to refer to him. He's reclining next to Jesus. And then Peter's like, you know, ask him. And so he asks. And so the disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. And no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that Because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. You catch that? No longer in the light, Judas retreats. His actions are now blanketed in darkness. He's masked the truth of what he's doing. I find it so strange 
about the signal that he gives the soldiers, his whole band, what he tells them he's going to do. Well, I'm going to kiss him like one kisses a rabbi, right? It's a sign of honor, of respect, right? And of submissiveness to his teacher, right? And I'm going to do this as if nothing is wrong, right? More than 700 men are showing up. Something's wrong, right? And you can imagine being surrounded like this, and Judas just responds, which, by the way, he does. Greetings, Rabbi. Greetings? Look what you just brought. Judas plays the fool right up to the very end, which I think is so interesting. And there's a crowd with torches and weapons, and Judas has brought them to Jesus. Finally, he's the leader, right? Finally, he's the leader. Only instead of bringing them to have Jesus, have them follow Jesus, he brings them to reject Jesus. And so Jesus here, he challenges Judas to examine the significance of what Judas has done and the way that he is misusing something that is so precious. Does Judas even recognize it? Is he aware of the signal that he created? The hypocrisy of his actions? He says one thing out of his mouth and his actions with his mouth literally do a different thing. His hands and feet completely do another. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? This is the extent of Jesus' public charges, by the way. There's, actually, they don't even really tell him what he did wrong. They just take him. Right? It, it's not a public arrest. It's like a kidnapping. Okay? And it's a, a military-style military operation. Right? It, it's as if Judas came, marked the bird. It, bird's been marked. Let's go. Takes him. Now, the rest of the disciples, I know you're somewhere in the crowd, you have been witnessing this whole thing, this whole time now. You also witness the things that have happened with Judas up to this point. You're witnessing everything that's going down, and make no mistake, they see the betrayal. They see what is happening. They see the injustice. Yet it doesn't matter if it was you or I here in this moment. There are really only two reactions that take place for this betrayal. We either become vengeance, right? We take on the role of Batman, as Peter does, okay? And we don't give it to God. We take it on upon ourselves. This is injustice. I am going to defend my Lord. Or we're going to be like the rest and flee. We're just going to flee because it is literally too painful to follow Jesus at this point anymore. It's too dangerous. Our lives are in, in stake. It's too painful. We're retreating. No one responds as Jesus responds. Jesus pre-told them what would happen so that they would what? So that they would know and believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the I am, He, the Elohim sent. The fact that Jesus uses this opportunity to remind them again. And then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Don't even tell me the charges. Not like you're gonna. But whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. This is a prime example of what the fear of the Lord looks like. Jesus is not being arrested against his will, is he? He puts them all to the ground just by simply stating his name. And Judas is not in charge of the mob, is he? Because Judas falls to the ground just like the rest. Who's in charge? Jesus. Jesus is in charge. Now, you must be thinking... How could this betrayal not hurt? Shouldn't it hurt Jesus to experience such viciousness and betrayal from a close friend? I mean, they've been traveling for three years together. They lived on mission together. How is Jesus not angry? How is he not upset? How can Jesus even go on at this point? I know I couldn't. When a friend betrays us, what we feel is 
the loss of trust. I've lost trust. Our heart is broken because what we have is no more. It does not exist, and it cannot continue the same. However it continues, no matter how it goes down and moves on from this point, it will never be the same. And so we are experiencing loss. We have lost something. Is this not how God felt with us in the garden, Adam and Eve? Is that not how he felt as soon as Adam and Eve betray him? Does he not feel the loss and he, does he not say? It cannot continue like this. Things have to be changed. Things have to happen in order for us to continue. But it worsens when we unravel the deception, doesn't it? It's not just that our friend did something that we did disagreed with. It's also that this whole time they've been playing us, right? That there's this deception unfold. We discover the lies that we've been told. And this hurt is, is actually not from loss. It's because we feel foolish. We feel like the fool. Because this whole time, we didn't know. And we should have known, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we have been able to see the lies that were right in front of us? Shouldn't we have been able to tell? Because the, something was different about the behavior, wasn't there? There must have been. And I must have been able to detect it. And this is where it gets dangerous. Because pride steps in at this point, And it tempts us. And we either seek vengeance. We seek vengeance on our own regard. How dare they make a fool out of me? Or we simply start to shut down. We shut down because how could I be so blind? I, I, I am the biggest idiot in the world. And look, these are the friends I picked. We run away just, and we can't take it as if we're denying the whole thing. So what can be done with betrayal of a friend? What can happen here? First, I want to say this. Trying to keep everything the same is not the answer. Okay? Oh, you just got to fix it, and everything will be back to normal. No, it won't. It'll never be back to normal. Things have changed. And so the answer is not this desperate attempt to always try to keep it what it was. Rebuilding trust is laborious. I will say that again. It is laborious. You're going to put hard work into it. You can get your elbow in there. But so should the other person. There should be effort from both sides. And so your real goal is to actually seek peace with your friend. It's to be at peace with them. But as Romans says, have peace with everyone to the best of your ability. Not their ability, your ability. You cannot control the other person. And when you come to realize you can't control them, I'm trying to have peace. Why can't you have peace? If they can't have peace, then it changes again, and you've done what you can. God is pleased with your laborious effort, and you should be at peace with it. The second thing, though, is is that we need to look at how Jesus handled his own betrayal. Okay? Jesus, as he experiences Judas betraying him, he still chooses to teach Judas. Did anyone catch? This is why we did this for like last nine weeks. Did anyone catch what Jesus said to Judas was a question? He didn't say it like, you're betraying me, in case you weren't aware. He asks him a question. Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? What is Jesus doing? He's destroying the false narrative of Judas, right? And then he's giving him spiritual truth in that moment. He is teaching him, no doubt. Yet Jesus has experienced the betrayal, and he's not immune to it. We think Jesus is like, no, nope, hard shell. Bounces off me, right? No, he, he, he's not immune to it. Oh, he experiences it. But he, and he carries that loss. He does. That mistrust, that hurt, and there are scars from it for Jesus, just like there are for you and for me. But where does he go with them? Where is Jesus headed after this? All the hurt and pain that he has had from people this whole time, where is he going? He's going to the cross. He is headed to where the Father has commanded him to, has asked for the obedience to, and he carries the sin of the betrayer to the cross, and he gives it to the will of the Father to be sorted out. 
I give it to you, Father, just like I give all the sins of the world. Our sins, too. His love for the Father is greater than the pain he suffers here. And that should be the same for us. I'm going to um, close in a, with a psalm that we can turn to. That, in fact, Jesus turned to as he was being betrayed. And these are the words of David experiencing betrayal. And that Jesus fulfills being the line of David. Start in verse 5. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? And when, uh, and when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers inequity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst from me. They say, a deadly thing is poured out on him, and he will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread and lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. Now, I want to pause here because we see that word repay and immediately where does our heart go? I'm going to tell you what this word means in Hebrew. Shalom. Which is close to the word peace. But it means amends. To make whole. To restore the thing that is lost. And we think in the perspective of our loss, right? We, our justice for our pain. But God sees it for both, doesn't he? Now, he sees it for both. He sees all that is lost. He sees that all that has been lost at the table. And this is why it's important to give justice to God in order to have him deal with it. His goal is to bring it to light so that it may be judged righteously and become righteous justice in the light. Jesus has this in mind when he experiences injustice. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen.